Happy Easter. I'm so glad we get to be here together. Welcome to everybody who's joining us online. What a difference a year makes, am I right? Like last year, can you just believe that no one was in church? And uh, I don't know, if you could go back to your younger self, like January 2020, is there anything you would warn yourself about? <laughs> like, would you go back and say, look, I just need you to know that no one's going to work all year. The interstate's going to be empty, so you can go as fast as you want, because everybody's working from home. Uh, baseball opening day is not going to happen until July. Nobody's going to be in church on Easter. Um, oh, yeah, dude, buy toilet paper. Lots of toilet paper. You'll thank me later. What a year. Nobody saw it coming. I think it's fair to say that 2,000 years ago this weekend, Jesus' disciples didn't see any of that coming. They didn't see Jesus dying. They didn't see him certainly being alive three days later. Uh, I don't know if you've ever had something that's caught you up short, um, caught you off guard. That happens to us all the time as part of being human, but that never happens to God. Nothing ever catches him off guard, unawares. Nothing ever slips by. In fact, God said through the prophet Isaiah 2,800 years ago in Isaiah 46.10, I, only I, am God, and only I can tell the future before it happens. Everything I plan will happen because it's what I want to have happen. It's an amazing thing to think about the power that God has, that he knows the future. It's another thing to consider that God not only knows what's going to happen and can cause things to happen, to think about that there's nothing that happens in our lives that he hasn't allowed or even caused. And even more than that, that he's willing to share with us some of what's going to happen if we'll pay attention. Case in point, the disciples didn't see Jesus' death coming, but Jesus told them over and over, here's what's going to happen. We're going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be arrested by the Jewish leaders, mistreated, handed over to the Gentiles and killed, but I'll come to life three days later. He said, it and they just didn't understand it. More than that, the Old Testament scriptures that they grew up reading talked about this is what's going to happen to the Messiah. They didn't connect the dots in time, but God had told them. Now, my question is, are there other things that God has told us that today can bring us hope that he said, here's what's in your future? That's what this whole series that we've been going through for the last several weeks at this church is about. It's called uh, the Feast of Israel. We're going back and doing a deep dive into the Old Testament to seven feasts or festivals or holidays that God gave the Jewish people. And you might think, well, why would we do that? So I can win the next Trivial Pursuit? No, it's more than that. Not only were these feasts for Israel put on the calendar for them to remember things and to worship God, they were also markers for the future. And what we've learned as we've gone through this series is that these were role-playing and enacting something that would happen in the life of Jesus. And so these festivals were almost like shadows, and the reality is Jesus. Again, you might think, well, that's good for the Jewish people, but Jesus has been here 2,000 years now. Why do we look at this? thing is, at least three of these festivals have not yet found their full fulfillment. So they're in the future for us as well. So we can look at these and find encouragement. Let me just do a quick review for all of us. What are these seven holidays that God gave Israel all at once? So four of them happen in the spring. The first three are the Feast of Passover, Unleavened Bread, and First Fruits. They all happen in one week, one weekend. Then you get 50 days out from pa Passover, you get Pentecost. Then in the fall, the last three are uh, Rosh Hashanah, it's the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement, and then the Feast of Shelters, Tabernacles, Tents, it's got several names. All of those have meaning and importance, and as we study them, we realize we, they have importance for us. Today, we're going to tackle two more, the last two we're going to talk about, and that would be the Feast of First Fruits and the Feast of Trumpets. So significant. And I think that what you're going to find is there's so much reason for you to have hope today, no matter what you're going through. So I'd invite you, you got a Bible, find a Leviticus 23. If you don't find a Bible somewhere around you or you don't have one, don't feel guilty about that. Uh, I would just encourage you to follow along. I'm sure you've got Leviticus memorized anyway, so this is not a problem. But for the, the slackers among us, let me just go ahead and read it, of which I am one. Starting verse 9. Of Leviticus 23, the Lord said to Moses, Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. When you enter the land I'm giving you and you harvest its first crops, bring the priest a bundle of grain from the first cutting of your grain harvest. On the day after the Sabbath, that would be Sunday, but Sabbath is Saturday. So on the day after the Sabbath, the priest will lift it up before the Lord so that it may be accepted on your behalf. So I want to paint just a real quick picture of context about what's going on here, because Leviticus is, like I said, 2,500 or more years ago. So let's just look at, um, or 3,500 years ago, I'm sorry, it's, it's a long time ago. And what was going on in this time is that 
the people of Israel, who had become the people of Israel, all the Jewish people were living in one place, and it was Egypt. They were all slaves there, millions of them. And God delivered them out of slavery in Egypt in one powerful night through the, a leader named Moses, and he brought them through the desert to the land that would become Israel. Along the way, they stopped at Mount Sinai, where God gave them the laws that would govern them as a country, as a people. The Ten Commandments were given at that time. God also gave them these seven festivals. They got all the holidays at one swing. And so this is what's going on here. And what Moses says with this festival is, when you get to Israel, you're no longer slaves. You're moving into a place where the houses are already there. It's move-in ready. You're going to harvest fields that you didn't plant. And when you do that, the Lord says, I want you to remember who gave it to you. When you go into the field and you harvest the grain, when you go to the grapevines and you take the first fruit, when you go to the trees and you pull off the first avocados or whatever, you bring the first that you picked the first that you harvested to God at the temple. You remember where it came from. You remember what God delivered you from and what he's brought you to, this great new life, and that's why they call it the first fruits. So I want you to get this picture now. So that was 3,500 years ago. You come to 2,000 years ago. Jesus and his disciples are in Jerusalem celebrating Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, first fruits. Jesus was arrested on the night that they celebrated Passover. Remember the scripture, if you're at all familiar with church, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and gave it to his disciples. That was Passover. Unleavened bread while Jesus was buried. So the, the first fruit festival is the day after Sabbath, the day after Saturday, Sunday. What day did Jesus raise from the dead? Yeah, the right answer is Sunday. You, you saved the class for all of us. Is it a coincidence that 3,500 years ago, the dates that God chose for those three holidays just happened to be the same three days that Jesus would die, be buried, and rose again? I don't believe in coincidences. We're talking about God who says, I, only I, could tell you the future before it happens. God intentionally put these feasts on certain days of the calendar because they mean something. The implication here of first fruits, what does it mean? What does first imply? That there's going to be second third, fourth. When you went out and you harvested your field, that wasn't all you took was just the part you took to the priest. You just, that was the first. There's a whole lot more coming. The implication of Jesus rising from the dead on the day of first fruit is that Jesus was the first to be resurrected, but he is certainly not the last to be resurrected. There are so many more resurrections, and that's in our future as well. That's the whole implication of this, and it is such a reason for hope. I want you to go to the New Testament now of your Bible, if you've got one. This is over in 1 Corinthians. This was written to Christians, and in verse 20, it says, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He's the first, and the literal translation of that, the, the original word there is actually first fruits. Jesus is the first fruits of a great harvest of all who have died. You go down to verse 23. Now, there's an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first, or the first fruits of the harvest. Then, Who? All who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. Every single Easter, and I've had a lot of them in my lifetime, we're one first fruits closer to when this happens. There is a date on God's calendar that Jesus will return, and everyone who's ever lived and been buried somewhere or lost at sea or whatever will all be raised. This is going to happen. It's a, it, it's a done thing. I want to show you something that even tips me off to believe this even more. This is not just once upon a time or wouldn't it be nice. This is a real thing. This happened the weekend that Jesus died. It's in Matthew 27. If, if you're somebody who's read the whole Bible, you may have read this. You may have never heard this before. It may be something you've read and you're just like, I don't even know what this means. So you just kind of glossed over it. This is fascinating. Verse uh, 50 of Matthew 27 Jesus shouted out again, and he released his spirit. This is as he's dying on the cross. At that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, rocks split apart, and tombs opened. The bodies of many godly men and women who had died were raised from the dead. What? Have you ever heard this before? This is like, why don't we talk about this more? They left the cemetery after Jesus' resurrection, went into the holy city of Jerusalem, and appeared to many people. What Matthew is doing is inviting people to just go, because Matthew was there in Jerusalem when Jesus died. He was an eyewitness to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. He was a contemporary of when all this happened. So when he writes these words in his gospel, he's inviting skeptics, just go to Jerusalem. 
Just ask around. There are a lot of people who saw these people who had been dead for years, maybe decades, maybe, I don't know who they were. They were walking around the city and people were like, what are you doing? We buried you. I don't know if they were famous holy people. I don't know if it was just somebody's great grandparents. I don't know if they had died a week before. All I know is they were holy people and they got raised, which makes me think, what in the world was going on here? I have so many questions. I don't know if you do. Like, where did they go after they were raised? Did, did you go back home? But what if it's been hundreds of years and you don't know anybody? Like, did they raise to heaven when Jesus ascended to heaven without dying? Did they die again and they have to be raised again at the last? I don't know. There's just so many things about this. I know this happened. Now, what is the significance of this? That when Jesus, the first fruit, who fulfilled the first fruit festival, was raised from the dead, that other people raised also. I like what one scholar, Zola Levitt, says. His take on it is that not only did Jesus himself fulfill the first fruit, that he brought his own first fruit offering to his father as well. And the first fruit offering he brought wasn't corn or, or wheat. He brought other resurrected people along. And this is what he said, Zola Levitt. Our Lord, not like unlike any farmer of the soil, greatly, gratefully brought before the father a few early crops of what would be a magnificent harvest later on. So here's another question I have, and maybe you do too. If this is true and accurate, that this is a depiction of reality, when is this going to happen? I, I want to know, don't you? It's been 2,000 years since Jesus rose from the dead. Are we like one day away from it? Are we another 2,000 years? I want to know. Well, and, and I want to say this too, and I'm saying this as Pastor Brian. This isn't just a hypothetical question if you have people that you love and care for who have already passed on and they're with the Lord right now, is it? When you have people that you love who are with the Lord, you're like, when is this going to happen? When are every person who's ever lived going to be resurrected into new physical bodies on a new physical earth? Because I'm ready for that. Well, let's go back to the feasts for a second, because I told you we're looking at two of them. First fruits was Jesus. But what about that feast of trumpets in the fall? What about that? This is so significant. Let's go back, first of all, to Leviticus and see how this was described. This is down actually in Leviticus uh, 23 and verse 23. The Lord said to Moses, give the following instructions to the people of Israel. On the first day of the appointed month in the early autumn, you are to observe a day of complete rest. It will be an official day for holy assembly, a day commemorated with what? The blasts of a trumpet. Do you know what one of the first signs will be when Jesus comes back to earth? A trumpet. You don't have to take my word for it. Let me read you some words that were written to Christians. Let's go back to Corinthians. 1551. Let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we all will be transformed. It'll happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when, when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to life forever. And we who are living will also be transformed. Same guy who wrote those words, the Apostle Paul, let me take you to what he said in Thessalonians, chapter 4, verse 16. The Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who've already died will rise from their graves. Then, together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we'll be with the Lord forever. Look, I don't know. I'm going to speculate a little. This is just Brian, okay? This is not scripture. But I just look at the Lord who placed the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus on the first fruits, unleavened bread, and, and Passover, and it's entirely possible that Jesus will return on the day of the Feast of Trumpets in the fall. I don't know what fall. I don't know, though, because there's other parts that, you know, you read the scripture that says nobody knows when Jesus can come back, so it, it, that feels like a little obvious, but, but maybe it will be. There's so many things that I think point to the fact that we're in the last times. I don't know if you know this or not. The scripture says that we're living in the end times. We're living in the last days. The time is short. This present age is passing away. This, if you look at all of human history, most of it has already happened in this present age. We're like in the very last part of it. So what do we do with that? If this is all true, if the fulfillment is coming and Jesus is coming back and every single person who thought they escaped this life without penalty is actually going to be raised to, to face their judgment as well as all who have accepted Christ and who've been in the Lord are going to be raised to eternal life. What do we do with this? Well, there's some challenge here. 
And I want to take you back to Thessalonians because there's some things that will help you maybe. And first of all, I want to talk to you if you're a Christian, because in my experience, and I'm not trying to judge anybody, I'm certainly not trying to put you down, but I think a lot of Christians know that Jesus is coming back, but I'm sure that the ratio of the people who know he's coming and the people who are prepared for his coming isn't quite up to where it should be. A lot of Christians don't live like Jesus is coming back. What do we do with that? And if you're not a Christian, I want to help you get ready for the day that Jesus comes back as well. So let me just go back over to 1 Thessalonians. We're going to actually go to chapter 5 and uh, see what Paul said there. He says, uh, concerning how and when all this is going to happen, dear brothers and sisters, we don't really need to write you. For you know quite well the day of the Lord's return is going to come unexpectedly, like a thief in the night. So we won't know what it is. So what do you do with that? Like it, it is going to be unexpected, but it doesn't have to catch you off guard. It's a challenging thing to think, like it could be now. There's nothing else that has to happen before Jesus comes back. You ever been reading a book and everything is such a mess and you go like, there's only like three pages left. How is the author? Grisham, you better pull this one in. I don't know how you're going to fix all this, but you better do it. Or watching a show on Netflix and you hit pause and you see like the red line is most of the way to the end. And you're like, wow, there's a lot of plot lines to be resolved here just in a little more. If we could hit pause on history, we're at the end of the, there's like this much left of the book, of the show. What do we do? Paul says this in verse 4 of 1 Thessalonians 5. You're not in the dark about these things, dear brothers and sisters. You won't be surprised when the day of the Lord comes like a thief. You're all children of the light. You're children of the day. We don't belong to the darkness and night. So hey, be on your guard, not asleep like the others who don't know Christ. No, you stay alert. You be clear-headed. Night's the time when people sleep and drinkers get drunk. But let's, we who live in the light, be clear-headed, protected by the armor of faith and love, wearing as our helmet the confidence of our salvation. What I don't want to do if you're a Christian is try to scare you. It's inappropriate. And Paul isn't either. He's saying, like there at the end, he said, you get the helmet of salvation. Christ loves you. He died for you. He cares about you. He didn't just invite you into his family so he could kick you back out. You know, the Bible says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that's just as true as my name is Brian and God loves you. And this is what he's called you to. And that's so real. But you're going to be in heaven for all of eternity. And Jesus is going to come back. Are you ready for that? I'm not saying if Jesus comes back and you're doing something wrong that he's going to boot you out, but how embarrassing would that be? Let's just live like we're people who are going to be in heaven. Let's live like we've been in heaven before. But I want to point out something else Paul says here. <coughs> Excuse me. Down in verse 9. God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ, not to pour out his anger on us. Christ died for us so that whether we're alive or dead, when he returns, we can live forever with him. Let's hang on to that. I love what it says in verse 11. He just closes this out, and this is where I want to close. Encourage each other and build each other up just as you are already doing. I know this has been a hard year for so many of you. It really has. It's been hard for me. And I hear the stories. Last, yesterday, our church, I'm so proud of you all, the meals that we sa- shared with our community. There were some prayer requests that came in from that that just it makes my heart hurt for what people are going through. I can't imagine going through the things we went through in 2020 and doing it without the Lord. I love what this church does. This is a church, whether we're here or we're online, you have been a church that sticks together with each other, cares for each other, encourages each other. Let's keep doing that. There's a whole world around us that needs the good news of Jesus. And they don't need to be in fear of when Jesus is going to come and when everything will end. It could be the day that you're looking forward to more than anything else. There's a day on your calendar when Jesus will return. And whether you're dead or alive, it won't matter. You're not going to miss out on it. And if you're a Christian, you should be looking forward to that with excitement. If you're not a Christian, I would love to help you put yourself and your life in a place where you could be looking forward to that, to say yes to Jesus, to let him be your Lord and your Savior, because he loves you. God wants everyone to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. And there's no exceptions to that. God will welcome anyone into his family who will simply repent and come to him for help. And I don't know what a better thing you could do in Easter 2021 than to turn to the Lord and accept him. And he'll welcome you if you do that. I'm going to pray for you right now. And I want you to remember this. This is what Peter said to some friends of his. He was saying, you know what? I know a lot of people are saying, well, where's the Lord? He's not come back yet. Well, he says in 2 Peter 3.15, remember, the Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. 
maybe Peter's talking about you. Maybe the Lord is waiting to come back just to give you the time to do what you need to do and get right with God. It's why we exist. We would love for you today, if you need to, to accept the Lord. We're ready to baptize you into Jesus Christ like so many other Connection Christians have done. If there's something that you need to do with God, do it today. You won't regret it. Let me pray for you right now. Father, I thank you for the love that you have for us. It's eternal. And you knew the future and you knew what we would do before you ever created us. And you said it's still worth it. I'll love them. I'll save them. I'll rescue them. I'll redeem them. Jesus, you were willing to give your life for us. We're so thankful for that. I pray now as we come into your presence that we will just realize that there's nothing that we need to hide from you. You know it all and you accept us anyway. Please, Father, move our hearts. Spirit, move among us that we know your peace and we know what you want us to do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.